Uh, thank you for attending the session this morning on uh, going global and why it's important for us to consider going global with our therapeutics. Uh, as we've been seeing throughout the course of this meeting and we'll continue to see uh, now for, we think, forever, uh, this field continues to grow. Uh, the momentum and the acceleration are just continuing at a pace that's actually somewhat a little bit frightening. And what that's doing is making us think about some of the uh, some, some elements of development much earlier than we thought we'd have to think about them before. One of the observations that we've made is the clinical development around the world has accelerated and other issues such as CMC are finding themselves in a position that need to catch up so that we can make the medicines deliverable. Today's session is really about not just the fact that there's growth within each geographic region, but the development is breaching geographic boundaries. Some of that is driven by market, some of that is driven by regulatory, and we're here together this morning to think, of, to talk to some experts in the industry, both from the therapeutic development side and from the tools and enabling side, to talk a little bit about what are the considerations for global development, when should we be thinking about global development, why should we be thinking about it, and what are the considerations that need to be layered in as we do our planning to reach global uh, markets. So I'll pause there. Also say I would like, like very much, we'd like for questions from the audience and engagement. So please, anytime during this, it's pretty informal. Would you please raise your hands if you have any questions? And I will bring a mic over to you and we can keep the conversation going. <clears throat> so I'd like to start by uh, thanking the panel for attending and maybe we could start uh, with Adam uh, Gridley uh, for an introduction. Each of the speakers will give about a three or four minute introduction where they come from, uh, how they're, uh, and, and what, you know, why we should be listening to them at this time for, for the uh, global expansion. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. So I'm Adam Gridley, the uh, president and CEO of Histogenics. We are a cartilage repair company that have recently completed a phase three trial in the United States and we'll be filing our BLA in roughly the next year, potentially seeking approval by 2019. The company's been around for about 17 years. A lot of that has been investing in CMC. Uh, the trial primarily was done in the United States with a couple of sites in Canada. And most recently, we've been doing a lot of work taking the technology that we've developed here and potentially leveraging that into Japan, starting to think about China and then Europe. Um, unlike a lot of the companies, we didn't go to Europe first, uh, partly due to expense and then also due to distribution and logistics. We can only afford to manage the autologous cell therapy product in the United States and within region. Um, historically, we've done our own manufacturing, largely because there weren't CDMOs available at that time. And uh, we now, I think, are at a, a neat inflection point where the regulations are coming together, both in the US and Japan. And then certainly as our trial reads out, we think we'll be able to uh, take that forward. Uh, historically, I've spent a lot of time in combination of BD and then technical operations roles. Uh, most recently, I was at Mertz Pharma based out of Frankfurt and was running a global business, which is about $300 million in sales, um, both across drugs, devices, and biologics. And one of the things that we learned there is plan early for CMC, be thoughtful about how you're going to go into each of the countries. Um, otherwise, you're going to do everything two or three times. Um, and it gets to be very expensive. So thanks for having me on the panel today. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Bob. Uh, my name is Marlene Forchet. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs Quality Systems at Irvine Scientific. Irvine Scientific is a, um, a company that was established in 1970, originally um, for the manufacturing and production of classical media and serum manufacturing. Um, we, of course, moved away from serum uh, by developing medias that were um, serum free, uh, animal component free, chemically defined media um, as the industry demanded that, that, that we move away from, from serum. We serve four different markets, the assisted reproductive technologies for the in vitro fertilization procedures. Uh, we serve the industry of cell culture media, um, serving the biopharma. We support over 30 um, commercial drugs. Uh, we also um, produce media for uh, cytogenetic business and now cell therapy and regenerative medicine. So all in common, what we have is the production of cell culture media. Our expertise and our um, focus is in cell culture, is what we do. Um, and we have a business, we've been in business for over 45 years 
and um, our focus is manufacturing quality cell culture media and, and the understanding from the industry on how to manufacture uh, the products from the beginning so that our customers doesn't have to go backwards. We do uh, manufacture our, uh, cell culture media utilizing global understanding of the regulations and the requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. David. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Mazzo. I'm the president and CEO of Caladrius Biosciences, and we're a cell therapy company that's focused on developing products in ischemic repair and in treating autoimmune disease, specifically type 1 diabetes at the moment. Uh, perhaps um, more recently than some of my colleagues here, we have had firsthand experience in the challenges of dealing with clinical development alongside of preparing and uh, maintaining appropriate standards on the manufacturing side, as you probably are aware. We're the former owners of, of PCT, and, the, and that transaction took place because we came to the realization that a company of our size wasn't in a position to provide the capital necessary for, for PCT to reach its full heights as a CDMO, especially a global CDMO. And so the transaction with Hitachi, we hope, has facilitated that while maintaining our close relationship with their expertise. Uh, we are really focused on global development, as you might um, imagine. We have programs that are running in the United States and are soon to be starting in Japan and, and Europe. Uh, my background is I've been in the, in the industry about 35 years and have had a variety of senior R&D uh, positions at companies like Merck and uh, RPR, HMR, which became Sanofi, Sharing Plow, et cetera, where I've been based in Europe. I've had responsibility for, for Japan and uh, Canada and the United States. And I think you know, the learnings from all of those years of experience really are brought to bear, perhaps in a more focused fashion, in the accelerated environment of cell and gene therapy development, where uh, you know, cost of goods, uh, logistics, and an evolving regulatory environment are more acute than they, I think, were ever at any time in the small molecule or, or traditional biologics world. So I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to, to sharing my experiences. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Julie, good morning. Good morning, thank you, Bob. <coughs> and thanks to PCT for sponsoring the workshop this morning, even though it is very early <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I, am, um, I work for Millipore Sigma and Millipore Sigma is the life science business of Merck KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany. The Millipore Sigma was formed uh, two years ago when our parent company bought Sigma Aldrich and combined Millipore and Sigma into that life science business. We're really focused on developing tools and reagents and methodologies that support science from the dis initial discovery through the, the clinical trial process and the manufacturing process and we provide uh, those tools from sample prep and gene editing and analytics on the discovery side and from the manufacturing side for APIs, ADCs, monoclonal antibodies, viral vectors, and cell therapies. And along the way, the sterility assurance and the bioreliance bio safety testing gives you that, that quality to be able to release your products. The interesting thing about our parent company is that it is, we are coming up on a milestone for the company and that is 350 years since its founding. Uh, we are in a unique position because it's 70 percent family owned to this day by descendants of the original founders. Um, the remaining 30 percent is traded on the German stock exchange. That family ownership gives us really a long-term view of um, being able to make investments that are going to um, be farther out than typical U.S. stock market-driven requirements. So I lead the cell therapy bioprocessing group, and I have an R&D team focused on process, uh, product development for tools and reagents to support manufacturing. This is media, single-use bioreactors and assemblies and downstream processing, and also a collaborations team that works very closely with our customers across the, the world to transition their traditional bench processes for manufacturing into 
uh, processes that will be commercially sustainable. So we have that exposure to the requirements and the regulations in many different geographies. My background is in cell and developmental biology. I've been on the manufacturing side for about 10 years and working with stem cells and progenitor cells for about 20. I, I love looking at cells. So the, the advances that we're making in regenerative medicine and the changes that, that's going to drive in um, patient health care is really exciting to me. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. All right, thank you, Julie. Jeff? Sure. Good morning, everybody, and I uh, agree. Thanks for sponsoring the panel. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun one. I mean, it's clearly going to become a much more um, lively topic as all of our firms uh, progress forward and, and, and others as well. So it's a, a timely topic for sure. So Bluebird Bio, we're a company that has um, four programs in clinical development. We're a gene therapy company that leverages the ability for the company to insert genetic material into a patient's own cells and then return those cells uh, to the patient where they are intended to either for severe genetic diseases, uh, ameliorate the, uh, um, the underlying uh, disease by having cells ultimately that can produce the protein they were otherwise unable to produce, or in the case of T cells, uh, to be able to um, allow those T cells to have functionality they, they wouldn't uh, have had otherwise. And in that case, it's uh, to be able to target very specifically a cancer type through antigen recognition and then hyperactivate the immune response locally to that, uh, um, to that cancer cell. So two, two fundamentally different parts of the business. Um, we have two programs, uh, one of which we just disclosed data just yesterday on our CLD program uh, and our thalassemia program that are in arguably for rare diseases, late stage clinical trials and we're moving uh, rapidly um, toward hopefully filing, assuming the data continue to look promising. Uh, and then two other programs that are um, really de declaring themselves uh, hopefully to move into uh, pivotal trials, and those are targeting sickle cell disease and multiple myeloma. Obviously, the multiple myeloma is our T cell platform, or leverages our T cell platform. The, um, um, so a broad, broad pipeline that is advancing fairly rapidly, so these commercial issues, not just US and Europe, but global are, are top of mind for sure for us. Um, I think maybe some, you said, mentioned some of the things that might be interesting for this discussion. One thing that's maybe a little bit unique um, is the fact that our first program, hopefully, to file on will be thalassemia in the EU first, not the US. So that's, that's pretty unique. It's not the normal path to go. That is a product of us being a part of the Adaptive Pathways um, regulatory uh, program, and it's a pilot program. Uh, now has advanced a number of years. Um, and, and in that case, it's HTA bodies and EMA together engaging in a discussion with companies to allow for rapid um, and, and early uh, access to, to, to market. So that's been a very unique experience, and we, we were um, one of the first pilot programs to, to go through that. But that's allowed us to potentially access the EU market first before um, the U.S. I think the only um, two other points that might be unique to this conversation Two of the diseases that we're pursuing, thal and sickle cell, uh, even though they're, they're orphan diseases uh, in the U.S. and the EU, the, there are significant populations of patients for thalassemia in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, and for sickle cell, in, in, uh, there's a great prevalence in Africa. So w these are things that we, we think about a lot. How can we access those markets beyond even U.S. And, and Europe? And what are the things that we need to do to, to enter those markets and at what time? And then the last is, just from a company perspective, uh, we have U.S. headquarters in Cambridge, but we now have European operations up and running in, uh, in Zug, and then we also, Switzerland, and then we also have um, uh, employees now in each of the four major countries where we hope to launch first, in the U.K., um, Italy, Spain, and Germany. Uh, France, excuse me, and Germany, not Spain just yet. So, so, so a few unique, unique things about Bluebird that, that are, I'm actually anxious to hear from the panel. Um, on some of the advice in moving into some of these, uh, the, these markets. That's great, thank you. Uh, just a little brief uh, background now that the speakers have talked a little bit about where they're coming from. We just want to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening at uh, PCT and Tachi Chemical Events Therapeutic Solutions. Uh, as David Mazo mentioned, uh, we had a transaction in May where uh, we sold the PCT entity uh, out from Caladrius to Hitachi Chemical Corporation. Um, which kind of, it's really, it really worked out extremely well because there was a dream, Hitachi Chemical, 
to have a global regenerative medicine business, and it was a dream at Caladrius to have a global regenerative medicine business, and we feel that neither one of us could have done this, at least with the speed and alacrity that we're doing it, uh, without each other. So our goal is to remove, we recognize now our customers, the industry is experiencing a tremendous amount of complexity. And I think if we just sort of hear just from five speakers that we've mentioned here, there's, there's a, a number of points that we can talk about. And the complexity is driving up costs and it's making deliverability of these therapies. And I don't mean driving them around in a truck, which is part of the deliverabil deliverability challenge but the manufacture, the testing, uh, and sending these therapies out in a way that they will work and they will be safe and they'll be consistent uh, and we'll be able to get reimbursed for them. A number of these challenges remain in our way and we just took them and made them more complex by saying we're gonna move to different markets. Uh, Jeff talked a little bit about culture difference. I think you didn't mention the word culture, but you're talking about having an office in Switzerland and we'll be in Africa and be in Japan. That's something that's often overlooked and as we now begin to set up our global network, we'll be uh, having our grand opening of our facility in Yokohama next week. And, and we're, we're looking at and trying to set that facility up. We've been, uh, we've been experiencing what it takes to set up two different cultures, two very different cultures, different languages, different parts of the world. And in our attempt to remove some complexity by streamlining and harmonizing the systems so that our customers can have the same experience in the United States that they have in Asia, uh, we're finding our own, we have to get that set first. Right? We've got to set that capacity pipe up in a way that it looks the same. But it can't be exactly the same because of all of the differences that we've mentioned and that we'll talk about. So those are the types of challenges that we're facing. Um, and what's keeping it all together is this desire to, to make this happen. And I think that's what's gonna drive, that's what drives all of you being here and all of us on the, on the panel. So uh, let me uh, stop there, and I'll just start with st starting at the end. We find one way that it's really good to bring everybody together, at least when we're trying to pull cultures and operations together, is to find where we go. So we'll start out by just asking uh, the panel to talk about a little bit about what is global development? What does that mean? And we'll start there and then look to see what are some of the things we need to consider so that global development actually happens. And maybe we'll start with David, because he's sitting in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> By default, I got By stuck default. here. So. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. No, it, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting. As, uh, as I was thinking about our conversations yesterday and, and today and, and trying to figure out what global development is, even the answer to that question has become so much more complex. You know, 20 years ago, in a, in, a, in a small molecule world where most of the pharma was, or 30 years ago, you know, global development really meant the United States, Europe, and Japan. The rest of the world didn't exist. It wasn't, a, you know, for most people, a, a, an important market. Uh, China wasn't mature yet. India wasn't mature yet. And so, you know, we kind of looked at it through that very parochial lens. And, and it was even worse because from a U.S. perspective, you know, most people felt that the FDA set the regulatory standards which funneled to the GMP standards and so as long as you sort of met the, the FDA requirements everything else kind of followed suit you know even though perhaps the other regions didn't look at it that way that was sort of the general uh, situation today it, it is so different because uh, for, at least from our experience there's no single place where you can say oh they're setting all the standards it's not you know it's not FDA it's not uh, PMDA it's not the EMEA it's they're leapfrogging each other in different areas you know one makes an advancement here and sets a sort of you know regulatory standard and and sometimes the others follow uh, sometimes they surpass them sometimes they go off in a completely different direction uh, also you know as Jeff was just talking you know we have now uh, therapies that can treat people who don't necessarily live in what used to be considered the major markets of the world. So you want to deliver to, to you know, Southeast Asia, you want to deliver to Africa, you want to deliver to South America. And those used to be afterthought markets, and they're no longer that. So it's, it's really difficult to decide what glowing, going global means. I think ultimately it's a company by company, product by product decision, which as Adam pointed out earlier on, is often driven initially by financial considerations. I think if we all had all the money in the world, and I don't believe any of us do, but if we did, um, you know, the, 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 the approach would be to think about all the markets where you intend to uh, commercialize your product, 
and from the very beginning build in all of the necessary requirements and, and compliance factors. It's impossible for us to do that, not only for the cost, but because those compliance factors are evolving. So I think, you know, for most of us, going global means, you know, looking at where you live, most of us start in the United States, and, and then looking at probably Europe and Japan as one of the next steps, although, uh, you know, like Jeff, you know, our first product launch will probably come outside the United States. And so even that is no longer, longer consistent. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question, but I think the bottom line is you cannot consider solely and parochially the environment in which you live to the exclusion of the others if you ever help, hope to be successful in a reasonable period of time and at a reasonable expense in those other areas. Thank you. I mean, as, we, as we talk here today, it just occurred to me that this is a really good opportunity for market research for us, <laughs> uh, and for the enabling companies mm -hmm. uh, to be thinking about what, what we, how can we help keep that dialogue yeah. going. Uh, Julie, would you like to talk to Sure. Uh, uh, side of that? I'm from yeah, it, so with a, a company that does have a global um, presence, like Millipore Segment, our parent company, and the experience with the other parts of the business. So Mark KGAA also owns a healthcare business, so we develop therapeutics. And so that knowledge of the regulatory environment does get brought back and is accessible to us through our quality and regulatory partners. And that helps us drive the development of uh, our products to meet the standards that are going to be appropriate across those different geographies. The other thing that it helps with is accessibility, right? And I think that um, we all know that there can be differences in raw materials across different geographies. But when you have that, that global um, vendor supplier, that can source materials um, and qualify them according to their company standard rather than a particular locale standard, that's also a way that it helps. We also have folks that are on the ground in all of these different geographies that are helping the customers source their materials, use the materials, and really make sure that we're getting that feedback on any of the gaps that exist in our product portfolio from a, a regulatory and quality. So what does going global mean to you? Right? Does it mean providing consistency, providing the highest regulatory? What, what does it mean? What does global development mean to a tools provider? So for, for us, and I think that this does vary across tools provider, it's around the quality and the consistency and the customer support. So we are there as an extension of our um, customers' needs, whether it's their R&D activities or their regulatory activities, that's what we're there to support them on. Do either of the other uh, therapy developers, Adam or Jeff, have a different take on what global development is? So I, I just a couple thoughts. One, one um, it's anchored in for us access. Um, and doing it right the first time. Um, and so, personally, I, I think we have to be, we, Bluebird, have to be really careful about the thoughtfulness of how we um, move the therapy into new markets. It, it starts for us in, in Europe and doing Europe really well. And it's country by country, first country launch, second country launch, learning from that, doing subsequent launches. Uh, then moving to the U.S. But it's all about giving the patient uh, uh, and providers and families a great experience, so getting that right. I think then once you've, once you've nailed that, to the extent that you can nail it, um, then you can think more broadly about the operational side of uh, expanding. It doesn't mean you don't plan for it ahead of time. It's just from an operational standpoint, given that these therapies are so complex and we're doing it for the first time, and we're going to have some missteps. Uh, doing it well is important in those first those first markets, and then expanding. What do you mean by the operational aspects? What is that? What's in that category? Well, it, it's it's a it, there's a, there's a lot. It's uh, understanding standard of care so that you can appropriately pursue access and reimbursement. It's getting the manufacturing right so that the patient is well taken care of from the second you touch them to the second they they get the therapy and even beyond. Um, 
It's uh, understanding the regulatory environment, understanding funding flows. I mean, it's, it's, it's all of that. It's everything that's unique to cell therapy that, uh, um, where you're trying to, to create new paradigms. And because of that, um, it, and in the end, it's all about did the patient get access to it? Obviously, it's did we, did we get a fair price for, for what we feel like we delivered? But if you can't give access to the patient in a consistent manner, that is a good experience. It doesn't. You, 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 the, the the global markets don't matter, right? Um, because you're going to run into those same challenges and more so when you go into global markets. And then I think the the only other point um, I guess is, <clears throat> from a progressive standpoint, you can also bring patients. You can you can globalize things by bringing patients to therapy in the initial stages. Now that's a limited patient source, and you got to understand that as well in terms of funding flows and the like and who, who, who's responsible for care. I think eventually we have to bring therapy to patients, but I, we, we look at it as kind of stepwise. Um, you, your core markets do them well. At the, in the same time, you can bring some patients to that, those core markets and understand how that works. That's a, a small step. And then ultimately bring the therapy to them, learning from those first experiences, uh, in, in our case, in Europe. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Marlon, the company's got a lot of experience in, in uh, global yeah. distribution. What, what does it mean to you? So, so as we know, you know, the, the challenge with manufacturing um, cell culture media for the cell therapy industry is the fact that there aren't any clear paths to follow. There aren't regulations um, that state how the media should be manufactured. So what we've done is take the approach to, uh, that we utilize for our class two and three medical devices. Uh, we, as you know, we register products in over 75 countries in the world. So we've learned each and every single side of the regulation for the uh, culture media that we prepare for the, the other industry. Um, we are very much engaged in learning the requirements from PMDA and EMA and FDA, um, the Chinese um, and CFDA medical devices, the Korean. And so what we have done is learned uh, the requirements from those countries and, and tried to um, feedback into the design of the media. So we utilize a, a, a risk-based approach. We utilize a quality by design. Um, our investment is in the development, the development of the media that can be used in preclinical, clinical, and can be utilized all the way to commercial so that uh, customers don't have to come back and, and, and redo everything once their uh, applications are approved. So it is about understanding the requirements and the risk and applying them uh, at the beginning. And so our learning experience is with the class two and three medical devices. And we as a company have made a business decision to apply the requirements to the development of media, even though it's for research and for academic and for the manufacturing use. So it is about learning, you know, how to make the media that can be used globally in, in the applications and that can be um, subject to regulatory uh, requirements and, and scrutiny and, and pass that. So your design space includes FDA, EMA, and, and PMDA, and then you distribute to 75 different markets? We, that, we, we do those three just pretty much do it, those three regulatory markets? Uh, no, so we, it, it's a constant learning. For example, um, you know, we, without mentioning customer names, we, we um, are supporting customers in Korea, and so the requirements for raw material qualifications and documentation um, seem to be a bit different than those requirements in the U.S. So as we learn and as we move um, a, um, towards the support, and if we learn anything new, we then implement that back into the design control of the media. And then um, we- how, how are you then sure you're not changing? Is it just testing, or is it formulation changes you need to make? No formulation changes. It's oh. understanding the, the comp- <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's understanding the requirements that go into qu the qualification of okay. every single raw material into that formulation. And so perhaps is the, the fact that we uh, have to go back and obtain more documentation for that particular raw material that the qualification uh, was, uh, was done following the EMA regulations and the FDA regulations. And so uh, it, depending, uh, it depends on what type of materials that are used, if they are high risk materials, 
what type of documentation. I mean, we've gotten all to a point to, to make um, uh, agreements with our suppliers so they can share their CTD or the technical information on the on the validation and activation okay. studies of a, of a component. For right, thank you. Great. So, Adam, from your perspective, then, um, maybe we'll just sort of move beyond the definition unless you sure. want to put a point on it. Uh, you've got experience in other industries with this mm -hmm. now in this sort of tissue uh, side of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, are they different? Does global development mean something different in your previous life to the clinic? Sure. Um, Yes, largely driven by some of the manufacturing challenges, distribution, logistics, and patient access. Um, so in a past life, it, it was the old days of sort of devices and, and drugs where you start in the U.S. or you start in Europe, for example, you can get approval for preclinical, and then you go broadly from there. The complexity was more on the labeling side and working with the individual regulatory bodies, but you had one body of data that you worked off of. And so it was really on the commercial side that you ended up spending a lot of time with in country folks where, hey, you've got sort of EMA approval, but then you gotta work with B Farm, and then you gotta work with MHRA. And we had a product that had um, a very strong label in the United States, for example, and we ended up with 18 different IFUs because we are in 88 mm -hmm. countries. <laughs> and everyone had a slight nuance based on PV, based on other requirements, and it was really complex. And that was many, many years ago where there wasn't the harmonization of some of the regulations that we have now. So there it was really sort of on the back end that you were able to sort of deal with some of the complexities. Here for us in the cell therapy space, it's just simply impossible to do the 15 sites in Europe, 20 sites in the United States, and then three in Australia when you want to do a clinical trial. Because you can't afford to drive the logistics required to support that. Um, so I think in our case, and, and I joined the company about three years ago, and there was a, just not right or wrong, but there was a US-centric, has to be made here, US data is the best, you can't use overseas information. And I think that was wrong. I think that was wrong in a number of ways, and I think it's, um, it's short-sighted, and it goes to Jeff's point, which is if you do it right the first time, you can then leverage into other markets. And that's been our experience uh, most recently going into Japan where the strength of the manufacturing data has allowed us to define a very quick regulatory pathway to then go into Japan <laughs> with a little bit more clinical data. So it's been, uh, it's been kind of an eye-opener to so see that difference. So there are two sides to that. There's the side about the regulatory environment that has to be ready to receive that. And then the right. product needs to be up to standard to make that happen. That's but right. Why don't we just move this a little bit into the regulatory environment right now? Because it seems to me that one of the drivers is regulatory environment. Certainly in Japan, that's what's happened, right? There's mm -hmm. been a national interest, a medi driven um, initiative to accelerate the regenerative medicine industry in Japan. And that moved into PMDA saying, we're here. Now, the here, regulatory environments, uh, regulatory regulators say that they're harmonizing. Last year, we had a panel in this very room talking with the regulators from different regions, from Europe, from Asia, from the US. And they talk about the harmonization or convergence or uh, yeah. whatever. David, you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, is that really happening? And is it is, that's that's really key, right? That's the standard. I, I, I think it's key, and I come from a very different perspective because I was an active member on on, on the ICH. Uh, working groups back in the day when, when they were working on small molecules and uh, you know new chemical entities and biologics and I had the I guess the added unique experience of working on the US working group and then working from the European side as an American on the European group and so from where I sit um, harmonization is not happening in the cell and gene therapy world not in the same uh, not with the same definition that we applied back then so I don't see a, an organized effort with a, with a predefined um, agreement that the participant regions are going to accept the outcome of the working groups once it, it goes through. I don't see that. I think there's a lot of communication, as, as there always is, between regulatory groups, but I don't see that necessarily translating into a consistency of, of requirements. And we've had a number of experiences re recently where, you know, uh, we, we talked yesterday a little bit about our experience with a, you know, with something as simple as a, a sterility test, and how in one region, you know, what was considered um, scientifically reasonable and logical 
wasn't acceptable in another re in another region, and you know, and as often you end up doing, you simply acquiesce eventually to what the regulators want, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to you in order to move forward. But now you end up with multiple standards for the same product. Yeah, and in that one, what's interesting, that particular case, um, is what we developed in that one region would not be applicable in another region. It's not something you could change, as Marlon said before, you can just change your yeah. testing. You couldn't do it. You really do now have two different... Clearly, in, in fact, you know, from our perspective, what that one region required would be laughable in the other regions. That's right. They would just simply laugh as laughable as it was the other Yeah, region. exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, so now you have a, 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 you know, true different standards for exactly the same product. And so that's not harmonization. That's not even convergence. That's, you know, uh, you know, a very parochial view. And that's just one example. But I can see that across the board, even as, you know, you see the 21st Century Cure Act, you know, the, the hubbub that followed that. And, and I st still don't see the definitions of what that means and how that's going to be reduced to practice. We have, you know, the accelerated pathways in Europe, with, which are a much more defined, but perhaps not quite as, as well defined in terms of the objective as in Japan. And, and in Japan, we have now the problem, uh, perhaps it's a good problem, but the problem nevertheless of the, the regulatory bodies on the clinical side uh, being extremely um, enabling, flexible, encouraging, and, and on the manufacturing CMC side, not so much. <laughs> so, so you've got one piece of your development getting way out in front of the other to the point where, as Adam and I were discussing before we came up here this morning, you could, you could be faced with the problem where you could get an approval based on clinical data and not be capable of providing a commercial product, which would be devastating not only for the company, but for the regulatory body that implemented the accelerated approval path. I mean, we've seen in this industry products that have been approved in one region and not allowed to begin trials in right. yeah. Bob, I do have an example Please. from the media part and mm -hmm. uh, adding to your comment and then answering your question that we have to do we have to change the formulation. So a few years back we were faced with that experience where we um, we had a product that it was sold everywhere in the world but when it reached uh, Japan there was a component in the product where Japan said it's not acceptable and it's acceptable only if it has it meets all of these requirements. And uh, you know, when you talk about say growth factors for example, they don't meet all the requirements um, that, that we were subject to. So we came back and um, there was a decision to reformulate for the Japanese territory. And so when and then we and that's when we added and the design control process of phase two, the feasibility of the formulation to check every single component of the formulation in these countries where we knew they had different requirements, yet the product was being used and move along in areas like the US and the EU. And so that, that's when we learned all of the, the, the requirements with the changes. And to help with that, the PMDA opened a division to help the, the industry to submit the formulations, do an assessment, and for and a service fee, and then they will let you know if, if those components are going to be acceptable in the preclinical and even commercial to be used. For, so and this is only for self for How do we know it passes your customers' right. requirement? Because the customers, um, the customers are subject to the PM, say for example, I'm the PMD. a biologic question, not a regulatory mm -hmm. question. From a biology standpoint, oh. So sure. we know that that's going to still create that same end product, we particularly have, in we the have area to where the products sure. are so complex. Right. We have trouble identifying in vitro right. uh, you know, characteristics. Uh, and, and that is why it's our responsibility to ensure that the components are, are tested for functionality and for um, to meet the intent that uses that product at the end user site. Um, and so the customer will need to test the material to make sure it does it make possible. you feel as a product developer? Well, it, it's tricky because um, we've seen very similar types of discussions, for example, follow the ICH guidelines, but they're not really so well defined. You, saw, you also have cultural and ethical considerations. In our case, we're using some biomaterials that then are combined with cells. And so in our case, it's collagen. And so, well, where's your collagen from? Is it from <laughs> Australia? Because that's okay in Japan. But then you've got to use a closed herd in Northern California. So we ended up in a number of interesting discussions and luckily,
because we had had to change raw material suppliers, we could show equivalents across both. But that was just luck because our supplier said, we're not going to give you this anymore, and we had to go find another one. Mm -hmm. But that would have been something where at the PMDA, ethically, it's a non-issue anywhere else or culturally. But we would have been doing everything over this again. Be a current product. This is with our current product. Yeah. So that's pretty well categorized. We have 17 years in, and but you can imagine so. that raw material suppliers change along the way, mm -hmm. and that's a really tricky one because it goes to equivalent. But it's different. I mean, we've done 17 years of manufacturing. That's right. They've got a handle on the final product yeah. in a way that most of the therapies in this industry don't. So, mm -hmm. Jeff, I'll throw that over to you with the uh, Orphan. Are you suggesting therapy. something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have too much to, to add other than. Uh, Totally agree with David that the harmonization is, is not there. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about it still, but it's not, not there. Um, I, I would say, though the engagement is fantastic from both sides, from the, the I can't speak to, to Japan only because we, there, that's not a market that we're, um, uh, is high on our list just because of the, the prevalence of the diseases we're pursuing. It's just not there, the patients aren't there. Um, doesn't mean we wouldn't go there, but it's not high on the list. But in the, the US and EU, the engagement level, the willingness to be flexible to, to some extent, um, the willingness to learn is incredible right now. I mean, we're at a time where I think the regulatory bodies are moving in the right direction in terms of willingness to, to have a dialogue and to learn and educate. The counterbalance to that is when they don't understand for obvious reasons because this is complex. That's when you get the pushback and the challenges and that's where you sometimes get these disconnects that are described. So I, I personally think we're heading in the right direction. It would be great if harmonization was, mm -hmm. was moving along at a more rapid pace. Um, but we're heartened by all the conversations we have with the, the authorities and for us it's gone. We had this one issue both with the US and the EU related to a manufacturing change that we made where we added two small molecules to the process of transducing the, 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 our, our cells from the patients. And that was a long, tedious discussion with the agencies to uh, get to a point which ultimately ended up to being favorable to move forward under the existing uh, IND and, and clinical program. But that was, a, that was a, a detailed conversation that happened over many, many months and, and, and many interactions. But the amount of engagement is quite, quite impressive. And the learnings too, the, 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 they're learning now because they've seen so many of these therapies come through from an IND perspective and now from some of the, the, um, the filings for approval that uh, I think that's going to even soften more over time. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, standardization now and is that the same thing, or harmonization, is that the same thing as standardization? And let's go back to previous industries, what have we learned? We have ICH uh, guidelines that have developed over the years. How does that apply here? Can we establish ICH? Guidelines in the industry. What has to happen, uh, David? I saw you yesterday said you wanted to take over this ICH committee. <laughs> <laughs> I said I hope somebody decides. Oh, yeah. to somebody. Somebody. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll, I'll start. How about that? You just uh, volunteer. Yes. So I, I think that there honestly is a big difference between harmonization and standardization, right? So harmonization gets you to a point where you have um, good guidance that can apply to our particular industry across the geographies and across the variety of products that we have. Standardization is, is more prescriptive. And so I think that our industry, because of the variety, when we think about tissue engineering, um, cell therapy, gene therapy, that driving towards that harmonization is where we need to go. And you see it with all of the, the groups that are coming up, the, the standards coordinating body, the ISO working groups that have these um, regenerative medicine tracks that's absolutely in need. We also hear it from the regulators, right? It, it's not as if this is something that no one wants to do. It's just hard because of the variety. When you look back at um, small molecules or uh, recombinant proteins, there's a little bit more commonality in those classes of, of therapeutics, but for regenerative medicine, you just, you're across the board, your cells, viruses, your scaffolds that are mixed in there, and how do you come to um, some agreement uh, 
on harmonization on what your guidance should be, how, how broad or how narrow or how prescriptive that should be. Yeah, I, I w if I could add, I think that, you know, I agree with Julie uh, entirely. Harmonization, in my mind and from my experience, implies compromise. Harmonization means, you know, the group of, of involved folks get, you know, sit down and, and let science and, and logic to a great extent dictate what becomes the guidances. Um, standardization typically means, you know, you take the highest, highest requirement from any one of the participating regions and make that the, make that the minimum requirement. And so, by, in my mind, by definition, standardization means everything gets harder, longer, mm -hmm. and more costly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and harmonizations, the goal of harmonization should be at Make least the opposite. Yeah, but that's, that's exactly yeah. the approach that we're taking with setting up a globally harmonized quality system to accommodate the, the easy movement of products from our clients. From because our there's no harmonization. So you have no choice but exactly. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the, but even if we had to change a quality system requirement mm -hmm. in one region or another, it, it has a cost maybe. It's right. more difficult. So from it doesn't a, change the nature of the product, no. right? A quality system is a nice right. umbrella to control right. the manufacturing process. Right. But there's some of these sort of self-journey ones are the ones right. that are scary, right? Because they have to change. They may have the effect of changing. So the, the problem is, you know, from a developer's perspective, if our enablers, our tool providers, our manufacturers, you know, choose as, as they logically probably need to today to go to a standardization approach, as long as they don't pass the costs along, we don't care. <laughs> but of course, there's no well, way. We're passing it. <laughs> 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 you could be sure. Tried to get that in there, but you know. <laughs> but no, but that that's, that's becomes Shit. the issue. You know that that you have no choice to remain a viable business to pass the costs along, and then you know it's a, it's a catch. You for, know, for those um, uh, for anybody who's a student of how this has happened before with drug development and form and then biologics development. Are we just at the beginning and things are going to get more standardized, more harmonized, or are they bound to get more complex okay. in this industry? One, sorry, do we need to do one before the other? Like, what's the best path? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Oh, no. do we need to do standardization before, before harmonization? <coughs> but, and, like, what's the, just adding to your question? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, because that's sort of what I was thinking, right, that standards underlie the harmonization. That's how I was thinking yeah, about it. Right well, and like I said, you know, from my perspective, harmonization implies, you know, engaged dialogue and, and a willingness to compromise mm -hmm. with a, a preconceived and agreed to goal. And that can't happen until there is some sort of formal process, you know, among regulating bodies to initiate that. So all the talk about, you know, working together is great, but it, it doesn't result in policy. So I think almost by definition, for those companies who are looking to be in a position to have a consistent product and who believe that there's a benefit to having a, a, single, a, a single supplier with a global reach, that naturally, I think initially, you're going to be faced with a standardization approach. Or you're going to agree to having uh, multiple uh, product definitions for the same thing based on its region. So yesterday's announcement, or last week's announcement, that the FDA awarded almost a $2.4 million grant mm -hmm. to the standards coordinating body, which arms mm -hmm. probably a, 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 an important member. Um, that, perhaps to get to your question, that perhaps is the first step, right? is, and that's why the FDA is doing this, because they want to harmonize. The mm -hmm. MDA wants to, everybody wants this, mm -hmm. but that compromise is difficult unless we have some standards. Mm -hmm. And I would offer up from the therapeutic side, being on the end of this sort of chain of vendors media, equipment, and everything else, is we're having discussions about our end product. We naturally have discussions about, well, what media are you using? What equipment are you using? What does your validation package look like? Mm -hmm. And so each of these folks are now dealing with individual harmonization, standardization mm -hmm. questions. And then we're on the back end sort of trying to keep up. And so part of our conversations were work with the vendor and use <laughs> the ICH guidelines. I'll be back in two years when we figure out how that little piece is going to work. And then you're stuck on the back end with a process or a product that you can't sort of trace back. So I think there's great opportunity, but as we go down this path, unless we work together, the concern is that you're sort of upside down and one part has been harmonized and you have clarity on how you're gonna sort of regulate that, but then you get to the end product and, and you can't sort of trace that all the way through.
So we had some really interesting discussions with PMDA, which says, well, your vendor can tell you how to do it. We talked to the vendor, and they're like, we're three years away from figuring this out. Like, there is no ICH guidelines. And so it can be really dangerous, and then you're stuck on the back end. So selfishly, as a, as a product manufacturer. Has anybody had a moment where they've gone to a regulator um, at this point and then not been able to move forward? Because the, re the requirements are so different that it would bounce back and change the product substantively? I can give you a different perspective from a past yeah. life. Um, as the agency has started to go worldwide, so you've got products that are coming in, tested overseas, or raw material suppliers. So if you get a critical raw material supplier for a product in the United States, US FDA is now going overseas. They're going to Switzerland, they're going to Japan. And culturally, we ran into a challenge many, many years ago where we had a Swiss manufacturer of a material for a medical device and they said, I don't care what FDA thinks. I do it my way. It was a very cultural sort of response. And there's almost, a, you're not coming into our facility. And we're sitting there going, well, what do you mean? And as I don't agree with how the FDA is regulating this, I follow the laws of EMA. And it was really tough because the agency I mean, literally called us as they were flying back from the plane and said they're obstructive. And they weren't obstructive. They just had different rules. So it's creating some really which interesting, turned out to be which it turned out to be <laughs> obstructive and we worked through it. But culturally, you ran into this huge log jam. Now, I think that's getting much better. But if you sort of take it all the way down to we can't agree on sort of standards, you get auditors out there who are trying to apply sort of their way of doing it. It becomes really dangerous. So the big markets, uh, we've been looking at uh, EMA as including uh, Great Britain, but it won't anymore. Uh, how does Brexit impact this? Are you guys thinking about that at all? We, we, we are. Um, it, it really hasn't had an effect on our strategy, per, per se. Um, UK is a, an important market for us, as are other parts of, of Europe. I mean, the only thing that it, it frankly affected was our, our thinking about tax structure um, and how to set up the company uh, in, in, the, in the early days. And we just now set up the European headquarters in, in uh, Switzerland. Um, so it had, had an impact there, uh, but, but not as it relates um, in any meaningful way to, to how we're going to move forward in, in, in pursuing the markets in, in Europe. Uh, it really hasn't. So. I would agree with Jeff. It hasn't changed our thought process about eventually pursuing markets in Europe. I think, you know, whether it's part of the European Union or not, the UK remains one of the, you know, the, the big five markets in that region, and you have to find a way to make it work. I also think that they're rational enough that they're not going to set up a completely different set of yeah. standards than the EMA standards, uh, at least initially, one would hope. But, you know, there's a more practical concern that we don't know how to deal with that we're considering, which is, you know, the studies that have come out that said when the EMA moves from Canary Wharf, you know, and has to leave London, yeah. um, that there's going to be, for some period of time, a, a, a shortage of qualified people working at that agency. Because, you know, depending upon which, you know, which country they go to and which study you've read, they're going to lose anywhere from 20% in the, in the best case to 90% in the extreme of the people who currently work there. And so you can imagine that, you know, sometime in the near future, there's going to be an inability for that agency to keep up with everything that is, that is going on. And that, I think, is going to make it, you know, more difficult to decide when to include Europe in your strategy for development mm -hmm. and ultimately commercial. It's, it's a really good point. And I think what, what, um, what we have tried to do, and I think uh, others uh, sh should do as well, it's just the relationships up and down mm -hmm. need to be there. It just can't be your single uh, evaluator. It, it really does have to be from top to bottom. Exactly. Because of that reason, it's always good practice to do that anyway, mm -hmm. but even more so now because mm -hmm. of the uncertainty of that, that changeover, and it's, it's a really good point. Mm -hmm. How about the tools providers? Anything concern about what's happening? So you're already, you're already distributing tools and media we, into these environments. We we sell all of our our products into this market. We have you know our local folks on the ground from customer support to account managers, and so our concern would be around the um, having different guidances that get put in place. But I think that that's not something that could possibly happen in the short term, that it would happen over years instead of months. 
So that, that's the sort of thing that we're concerned about. Is there a role that ARM can play yeah. as this is all happening? Charlie, I'm trying to understand, you know, maybe influence the early uh, publishing of where are they going? Where are we going? So, for example, we do have medical devices that are CE marked, then we don't know if the UK is going to come up with a different standard for distributing products in the UK. And are they going to, if, if EMA is moving out of the UK, are they going to now have a different um, uh, authority agency that will review the technical files in addition to the EMA? Because our files do go through EMA review in order for us to obtain the CE marking approval. So we we are unsure as to um, what is going to be, what, what's going to regulate um, in the UK. We, we do think that they are going to come up with different standards, hopefully in somehow harmonize with the rest of the European community. We, think, right? we, hope, we, we hope so, yeah. We sort of be silly not to. But you know, to your point, I think that you know, all of the major professional organizations associated with the industry, whether it's ARM, bio, pharma, mm -hmm. you know, fill in the mm -hmm. blanks, I think they have a, a really critical role to play because it's generally you know, more acceptable to challenge the regulatory authorities through the cover of those trade organizations than to do it as a single company. Because as a single company, you're always worried about, you know, I'll say retribution, but you know, creating a, a bad ambiance, you know, getting a, a, a reputation at, at a given agency for being a troublemaker. And, 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 and you're always worried about, you know, will that reflect on, on the speed at which your files are reviewed and the flexibility, et cetera. So I think, you know, the trade organizations have a role to play because they can go in and say, we're speaking for the industry, no individual company gets put on the hot seat. But we say, you know, it doesn't make sense economically, it doesn't make sense medically, it doesn't make sense culturally to establish completely different standards. And here will be the impact if you do that. And I think that's a, a really important one role. of our strategic priorities is regulatory harmonization around the world to the extent possible. Right. Is that right? So and we've talked about objectives, and Jeff is big on objectives and really defining what that means. This may be a really interesting one. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's arms role. Yeah, I agree. Sort of getting out ahead of it. So I, I, I'm going to pause here for a moment and move the discussion to another level, but would love to uh, open up for some questions. Um, if you have any questions or want to just maybe make some comments based on what we've heard so far. And uh, Bethany, quarterback, will throw you a microphone. So <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So uh, the next level is if we, we keep talking about doing this early, uh, and you know, sort of getting out ahead of this and setting a standard for your product development, um, your tool development, whatever it is, that will have legs to go through a sustainable uh, commercial delivery over the commercial life of the product. What does that mean and how do we do that? Where do you start with getting out ahead of this and doing it early? So maybe I'll, I'll take our, uh, our first crack at this. Just. Fundamentally, for, for us, uh, uh, it's about just understanding the, the different markets. First and foremost, obviously, just understanding, um, and so I'm really talking about outside of the U.S. and EU right now. Um, so maybe I'm switching, switching gears a little bit. And it's just understanding those markets from all the perspectives, from what is the regulatory path, um, and, and how, how do you best uh, pursue that. Uh, the second is really understanding the standards of care for the individual therapy that you have. Um, that, that's, that's hugely important. That's true in Europe as well, uh, given there's, there's a variety of standards of care, at least for some of our products, country to country. Um, understanding the reimbursement environment is critical. Um, I mentioned before, that's both with patients entering, uh, moving to countries, so they're following the therapy into countries. Um, but then also, how can you get your therapy to, to those, to those no re, new regions? That's also true in, in Europe, because we're not going to be setting up likely manufacturing operations in each country in Europe. It's going to be a bit more, at least initially, of a regionalized approach. So you've got, you've got cross-border uh, challenges even within, within Europe mm -hmm. that are going to be uh, interesting to, to see the funding flows associated with that. 
um, and then understanding what policies uh, are, are there that need to be to be changed, both within Euro Europe and then potentially elsewhere as well. So it, for for us, it's it's uh, doing the market. The markets are entering right really well, but in the background, really understanding that landscape that is some of it is just unique to the country. Some of it is very unique to your therapy, um, as it relates to the, provi the the physicians, the patients, the standard of care, all of that. So for us, it's 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 that's what it's all about initially, and then really thoughtfully thinking about how you progress to to enter new new uh, new markets and how you enter new markets. I think the other one is government relations. I think it's going to be really, really important in these markets. And starting that early, starting the dialogue, I'm going to give you an example in, in Thailand um, where there's a significant uh, a challenge with thalassemia patients. It's uh, uh, quite a challenge for that government. Now, I know that's not, it's, it's not an easy uh, environment in which to, to operate a commercial entity, but have, we've have been having discussions with uh, um, some, some government uh, officials there for years. And we continue that dialogue uh, in, in hopes that it, when we're ready and when they're ready, we'll be able to enter that market and, and find a solution for, um, that, that makes sense for, for all parties. So that's another big, big uh, planning aspect one, one of, the, of this I engagement. Thought, I always respected this about Uber, bio, uh, even from when the company was very, very small, maybe even before the company, uh, you brought on a commercial officer mm -hmm. before that happened. And that was a surprise to me at first because that was something that no other companies that we worked with or saw in the industry were doing. Is that, that an attempt at this sort of thing? I mean, what markets do we want to go in and then work backwards from there, set up a target product profile, perhaps, and really think about that thoughtfully? Did this thought come in? Different regulatory environments, different reimbursement mm -hmm. environments? Is that part of that planning? Yeah, it was part of the understanding of the different markets, for sure. Uh, but that wasn't just with a head of commercial. That started with Nick. Um, uh, he and others in the company, myself included, have spent some time in China, in Thailand, in the Middle East, um, really engaging and understanding those local markets. Now, we have to do a lot more. Uh, for It's clear that we've just scratched the surface. But it's been over years of trying to understand uh, the, the challenges, too, that those, those countries face. And then the the barriers and the opportunities to, 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 to work with them. And there's some really creative things out there because these therapies that we're all pursuing are so potentially transformative, it opens up an opportunity for a dialogue. Um, and and that's, that's pretty unique, so. And on the other side, you, you inherited a company, Adam, after 17, 14 years in the making. Was all that there in place, or did you have to put that in? Let's no, not at all, and it, it's actually something if I were to go back and sort of I own this and, and was a scientific co-founder, I, I probably would have thought about some of this. Um, and particularly as you think about commercialization early, so manufacturing is really hard, clinical pathway has been really hard, particularly in this space because there was no guidance documentation, you didn't know how to run trials, but now we're getting to the end going, oh my gosh, what are claims gonna be? Mm -hmm. And we ran a pretty robust trial in our particular case on pain and function. And so we think we've got this great pitch going to work in the United States, and as we've gone to Japan, one of the big wake-up calls for us was how care is, is sort of doled out by providers. And we were talking about the fact that you can be out of the hospital or the surgery center in an hour with our therapy, which was a great benefit. And our surgeons are like, that's not happening in Japan. Just not going to happen. They're in the hospital for a week. So the value proposition. And so we're, we're talking about this value proposition. Is like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. and it, was a, it was a big wake-up call for us. Now, there are going to be a lot of other benefits that are demonstrable. It's going to be a great product if approved. But the big thing that we thought was going to be really important, had we done some of that commercial planning early, I don't know if we would have designed the trial differently. But as we think about our claims, it's certainly going to be a very different conversation with the reimbursement folks. Yeah, I think that so. touches on a very, very interesting point. You mentioned the target product profile, That's and it. you know, in the in the non-cell and gene therapy world, most people consider the target product profile essentially the label that you're aiming to get, right? But um, but in our world today, it's it, you know, it's not so so focused solely on the clinical outcome. It's got to define the product from the commercial and manufacturing perspective, and it has to deal with how the product is ultimately delivered as well. So it's, it's a much broader thing, and I think, you know, to, you know, to Jeff's point, you really need to think about that from the day you decide that you're going to embark on a development program in a given area. Because if you don't, you'll, you'll be faced with, as many of us are now, you know, years later, 
running up against these things and saying, oh, we've got this great target for a label and the industry, or rather the region in which we plan to launch, doesn't care about that aspect of the label, or the physicians don't see that as the value, or we neglected to define into the product definition aspects of, com of, of manufacturing that are key in that region to identifying that product. And so you, you, you're kind of doing the opposite of what you know, good quality development is, is you're adding it on at the end as opposed to building it in from the beginning. So when, you, when we see a target product profile, in fact, we're, we're, all the development work that we do now, we practically require one. Mm -hmm. and so but that drops <coughs> from us a quality target product profile. Where we go from a manufacturing side. Right. How will we maneuver? What will we need to do? What will we need to consider? But, but I must admit that a regulatory consideration about reagents and things that you use, I don't know that we're, we're yeah. doing that. We will today for now. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I think really thought about that. But what do we learn from a 350-year-old company who's been doing this and distributing products all over the world? Is this just easy for you guys now? You have What's the system you could share with us so that we can all make this problem go away today? I, I'm not sure that having that global reach is, is easy, <laughs> right? I mean, you do have to work across um, different time zones, different cultures, different holiday systems, um, supporting all of the folks that are in the, those different regions. So I, I don't necessarily think that um, being a global company is easy. I think be, ha, being able to have a very regional focus is probably easier. It may limit your um, market access and your ability to grow, and that's why people um, go global. But um, you know, one of the things that we encourage from a, from a supplier side really related to the manufacturing is to do the boring stuff, right? Do that comparability planning. Understand your critical quality attributes, your TPP, and be able to say, okay, talking to your vendor partners, look, I'm not gonna use GMP reagents when I'm in preclinical. It's just not gonna work, but I know I'm gonna need this type of reagent or this type of device as I move into that clinical trial arena, into the commercialization, what should I be using that's going to make that transition easier as I go into that commercialization experience in a global environment? Really working with your partners to identify the best um, products to be using in order to be cost effective, but also make that transition easier so that there's not the um, repetition of clinical activities that's required. What's the main driver? Is it market access? Or is it regulatory environments that allow you to get data to bring to other markets? If, if you could take the data from a, an accelerated approval program in Japan with 20 patients and bring it to the United States for approval, the 21st century cure, you don't have to do any trial here. Is that a reason to go to another market? Or is it if that cases? were in fact the case, that would that be case, clearly a, a reason. But I think you know, it, all, it all comes down to, I believe, the fact that we're all committed to, you know, to helping solve medical problems, to meeting on met medical needs. It sounds all very cliche, but that's really the purpose, right? Ultimately, we, we do so non-philanthropically. We want to you know, make money for our shareholders and uh, but, but ultimately, the idea is to deliver the therapies to the patients who need them. So it's about the market. It's about the market access and getting to the patients and, and finding the path of least resistance to getting to the largest number of patients as soon as possible because that's the way you do the most good, but it's also the way that you recoup your investments and provide a return on investment. So they do go hand in hand. And Bob, I would add on that particular question, that's exactly what we're thinking about where in Japan as a proxy, and we've seen this and heard this yesterday, sort of iPSC, allogeneic standards, preclinical pathways, and the ability to get into the clinic is probably a couple of years ahead of the United States. Not sort of good or bad, it's just the reality. Culturally and scientifically, there are more trials there. One of the things that we're thinking about is we're taking a robust phase three package that allows us to accelerate into Japan. We'll collect some additional data we may in fact go and do allo trials there first and then come back to the United States. I don't know how successful it's going to be, but we look at it and say, um, can we get access to patients earlier because of the difference in regulations? And the answer is yes. And it's not that one clinical package from one country is better. 
but go where the standards are more developed. And that's our plan, to be able to leverage that and then potentially come back and use that elsewhere. <coughs> Particularly in cell therapy, when you've got the manufacturing challenges, you can't do trials in every country. So how do you think more globally from that perspective? And you go to where the regulations are in place. And I think, I think patient is patient access. It's mm -hmm. just all about uh, access. Um, I think the regulatory environments are pretty favorable right now. It may be difficult to hear or there, but they're pretty favorable. We'll figure out the, uh, the operations model um, over time. It, it's going to be hard, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll make some mistakes. I, I would so just add to one other uh, question you had before in terms of um, uh, setting up uh, early commercial um, drivers. I mean, certainly one is regulatory and understanding the regulatory pathways in, in these countries, and I think that's a really interesting one in Japan. Um, that's a product of understanding for your particular therapy. Uh, where best to go to go first. I think government affairs, uh, I wish we had invested in government affairs as an organization even earlier than we did. Um, we now have two people uh, in our government affairs group, two great people uh, at the company, and doing amazing work, working with ARM very specifically to drive uh, to policy initiatives. Um, but in terms of getting into other markets that are just outside of the US, EU, and Japan, that's going to be fundamentally uh, critical. Uh, and then the last one is patient advocacy, really understanding the patient groups in the individual countries in which you're, and having a relationship there. That, that also is something where we've learned so much through that engagement um, that those learnings are invaluable um, to, to thinking about where you go first. For all the things we've been talking about, standard of care for each individual therapy, the challenges, the opportunities, the, the support that you can get from that, that community to drive change as well. So those are, those are the things I wish we had, frankly, invested earlier in mm -hmm. um, as it relates to, to, to kind of thinking about commercial. Mm -hmm. right. um, does it matter platform type? Uh, you mentioned IPS, you're in an IPS situation, you may want to go to one market. I mean, is that, is that driving any decisions here? So is it market access is big, government affairs, the regulatory? What's the role of the type of product you have? I don't see that as a, you know, I, I see that as a, a tactical consideration, but not a strategic one. You know, it, it's, you deal with the product that you're intending to develop and you manage it accordingly. I don't see that as a, as a driving force. I think it really comes back down ultimately to market access and, you know, getting to the patients that need the therapies in the most rapid way possible. So uh, as a media supplier, Marlon, um, and doing this all over the world, different markets. What advice would you give our uh, members of the, the, the audience as to what they should be thinking about now, or thinking about going forward? To think about um, when they qualify the media, the reagents, um, disposable processors, anything that they use as an auxiliary to their, their process, that they do understand um, by early dialogue with their suppliers. Um, how the supplier have manufactured the media. Will the supplier be able to provide all of the support needed for the media information, such as documentation, formulation, the validation methods, especially if the components in the media are the high-risk components considered by the regulatory authorities? Um, so having early dialogue with the suppliers, and so the more that the the earlier that this happens, the better it is going to be for for um, uh, the the end result. And the more the supplier understand what your needs is going to be um, later on, the better because then then we prepare um, a, a ahead of time for the customer as well. So the, the customer is, is will have a requirement at times to know what's in your secret yes. sauce. Yes, yes, and then we <laughs> travel Talk a little bit about that and drug master files and how drug that's different files. in different parts of the world and how that how we can help there. So we, we struggle with the fact that um, customers at a certain stage um, of their of their um, submission uh, will require to know certain components in the formulation, quantitative and qualitative information, or the entire formulation. Depending on the region they are filing, if the drug master file does not apply, they will need to know the entire formulation. Um, this is something that we were not accustomed to because the biopharma um, does 
process differently if the, if the custom manufacturer media for them for their um, final drug application. Whether, uh, whereas the topical to media used in cell therapy is more um, a, a catalog item from companies and they, they, um, they use it to their application, it works well. So we have to learn uh, why was the customer requesting sharing of a formulation and IP information um, and, and it took some time for us to learn. We have to visit with uh, some of the regulators in Japan, for example, and they do explain to us that customer needs to know the formulation to be able to do an assessment on the residual of that media into their application. Mm -hmm. So we came back to our organization, we get back into the legal groups and say, we need to come up with a solution for our customers if we're gonna be in this business they cannot be held up in their approvals because we're not providing them what they need. So that was just, that's one of the um, harder lessons we have to learn. So we have to come up with a legal approach to that. And the customers are willing to engage into um, CDAs or, or legal sharing of information. The other part of this um, struggle that we have faced is also managing our supply chain. The, there are components that our suppliers were providing for our media manufacturer that are high risk components. And so our suppliers have to share the same type of information so that we can then share either with, directly with the regulators or with our customers. And so educating our, supply, our suppliers uh, has been also a, um, another task. Uh, making them understand that it's important for them to share the technical files and the validation for vali um, inactivation, virus inactivation studies, for example. And it's at time difficult for the suppliers to provide their know-how, their IP, and so we also have to enter into legal agreements with them. So quality agreements, supplier agreements, um, CDAs have become a big, big um, a requirement for cell therapy for research use only products or for further manufacturing these products. So it's, it's learning that early, very early in the, in, in the um, process, the better. So managing the supply managing chain. Managing supply chain yeah. from customers yeah. to media manufacturing, media manufacturing all the way to the, the chemical components. Okay. Okay. i just like to stress how important those points are <laughs> and what it is doing for us on the back end as a therapeutic provider we're getting exactly those questions, mm -hmm. and we need to do vendor audits, and we need to have a C of A, and we need to, with these conversations with the PMDA, and they're great to work with in all cases, but we're actually now choosing vendors who will then respond to exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Exactly. Um, and we've got, we've got a person in our engineering department, she literally puts on camouflage and goes through dumpsters to try to get stuff. I mean, it's an exaggeration, yeah. but do the same. trying do to find the someone same. in at a big company, for example, right. in Germany that's going to respond to our call because we used mm -hmm. this twice. Yeah. And it's the most critical part of conversation with the regulatory agency, and we could lose six months because no one will return our phone yeah. call. Okay, and then when you get the me. right person, call me. <laughs> and well, the thing is, I, wonder, I know who to call here. But I mean, this is absolutely critical. And, and in some cases, we've had to go to other vendors, and then you have the equivalence discussion. So, hey, this is so we, critical yeah. for us on the back end is to have people that are thinking that way in advance, have the customer yeah. support and don't have the normal, sorry, that's protected, we can't have that yeah, conversation. Okay. We'll give you a Not letter. Not for this product well, well, letter doesn't do anything. Do that anyway, particularly with something as critical as media. I mean, you need to know what's in your media when you're developing yeah. your product. That's right, product but product. Yeah, yeah. And often we get the, we know what's in it, don't worry about it, no, it's protected. <laughs> and it, it's not obstructive, it's just yeah. that's the old yeah. way of doing so what, a lot of things. So I mean, that's we, not acceptable anymore. So, so what we're doing now is uh, at the qualification stage of the raw materials, if we, the first thing we need to do is to obtain all of that documentation. If we don't obtain documentation, we don't even move into requesting three samples of three different labs to test. It has to be done up front. We, if we can't obtain it, we don't. And sometimes the regulators give our customers 60 days to, respond to, the, to respond to the queries. And so we have to then get the information with the suppliers and, and it takes uh, time to get through them. So now we, we change everything and the qualification requires all the documentation that we know now is needed. And so at times it's delaying our design a little bit because we have to qualify and invest a lot of time up front. Um, also it requires more resources. 
but it's, it's better to do that up front than to hold So for the purchasers in the group, this is why the cost is so high, because you have all these requirements. <laughs> Absolutely. So you know. Are there any uh, questions at this point? There's a few. Yeah, please. Um, I, I can um, answer that. We the experience is that there's documentation after documentation. There's a lot more requirements needed for for the cell um, for the cell therapy um, cell code media, and also we have been imposed certain testing to be added to the components upon receipt receipt or to request the testing of the supplier. So, for example, even though a component have already gone through a viral inactivation validation testing, they do require that we uh, do the testing to confirm that the, any pathogens or any contaminants are absent from the raw material. They, um, we do not have experience that our products have to have a registration, uh, such as uh, fighting gate clearance or CE marking. But we are considering that as well, um, because once you have a um, go through that path, then the, the the files go through more scrutiny that we might be missing for the customer. So it, it, it's better. So we are we have been working on um, a plan to see which products should should we start a registration process. But we have to have a, a, a very wide uh, intended use for those products. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't right, be able right. to. Shoot yourself yeah, yeah, we won't Julie, be able to. Get it. So uh, we're, we're very similar to Irvine in the, the documentation that we are, um, that we have related to every single raw material that would go into one of our more complex products like media. And so that is all um, assembled ahead of time. So we do the qualification and validation of the materials, identify second suppliers, do the validation of those. Um, before we can even include a certain raw material in our media, we haven't um, started down the path of registration for those products, but I think that it has to do more with the, the market size for each of the products and the cost on top of what we're already doing for the, the validation and the qualification of the raw materials. We just get to a point where it's not, it doesn't make sense from a financial perspective, but we would be there as our customer's partner in order to respond to any of those requests from the regulators. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other comments or questions? I think we're at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. right now. So I want to thank you very much for attending. I think the take-home lesson uh, <laughs> is, the, is the easy one. We could have started with this, I think, which is really think about this very, very early, and that we should be considering now that the markets um, are global markets, that the, it's really multiple regulatory environments, multiple um, standards, multiple types of uh, uh, reimbursement models we have to be considering, and the earlier we consider these in the product development pathway, while it may feel a little bit silly at the preclinical and into the phase one and phase two, we could prevent putting little time bombs into our processes that will prevent us from entering really major markets and serving the patients in those markets. So I ask you please to thank the panel um, for the discussion and appreciate you coming this morning. Thank mm -hmm. you.